Many of us might have heard about risk aversion, which is a general dislike for risk. But what is ambiguity aversion? To address this question, we need to first distinguish between risky events and ambiguous events. Let's do that through a practical example. Imagine a simple coin toss game where you win a dollar if the coin lands on heads and lose a dollar if it lands on tails. If the coin is fair, you know that you'll win a dollar with a 50% probability and lose a dollar with the same probability. In this case, the probability distribution of outcomes is known, and you can quantify your expected return and risk. So this game qualifies as a risky event. What if you play the same game with a biased coin without knowing the probabilities of heads and tails? Now, the probabilities associated with the two possible outcomes are unknown, and you are in the dark about the degree of risk you'd be bearing if you played the game with such a coin. This is an example of an ambiguous event. There is ample evidence that people are ambiguity-averse such that they'd prefer to play the game with a fair coin rather than a biased coin with unknown probabilities, even though the bias could be substantially in their favor. This is also known as the ambiguity effect. American economist Daniel Ellsberg's research in the 1960s played an important role in providing evidence of ambiguity aversion. In one of his experiments, there are two urns with 100 balls each. Urn A contains 50 red balls and 50 black balls. Urn B also contains both red balls and black ones, but the ratio of red balls to black balls is unknown. First, you're asked to choose between bet 1 and bet 2. With bet 1, you draw a ball from urn A. If it's red, you win $100. If black, nothing. Bet 2 is the opposite. You win $100 if the ball is black and nothing if it's red. As the number of red balls is equal to the number of black balls, we're indifferent between the two bets. Next, you're asked to choose between bet 3 and bet 4. These two bets are the same as bet 1 and bet 2, respectively, except that the ball is drawn from urn B. Most subjects are indifferent between bet 3 and bet 4 as well. This suggests that subject assume equal numbers of red ball and black balls in urn B as well. Now, here's when it gets interesting. When subjects are asked to choose between bet 1 and bet 3, most prefer bet 1. And when the choice is between bet 2 and bet 4, bet 2 is the preferred choice. This is evidence of ambiguity aversion. Subjects favor urn A over urn B as the ratio of red balls to black balls is known for urn A but unknown for urn B. How does ambiguity aversion affect the choices we make? Let's discuss that through specific examples. An influential paper by Easley and O'Hara point out that prior to the mid-1990s, more than two-thirds of American households held neither stocks nor bonds according to survey evidence. They argue that this may be because some individuals find the ambiguity in capital markets too great and thus avoid investing in stocks or bonds. Their results indicate that regulations crafted with ambiguity aversion in mind can help increase participation in capital markets. A study by Berger et al. 2013 examines the implications of ambiguity aversion in the context of healthcare. They focus on ambiguity regarding A, the diagnosis of a patient, and B, the effects of treatment. They find that the diagnostic ambiguity results in an increase in the medical professional's propensity to opt for treatment. Conversely, there's a reduction in the propensity to choose treatment when the therapeutic ambiguity is higher. Our next example is about how ambiguity in product reviews influences our purchasing decisions. Imagine you're interested in purchasing a new coffee machine. You've identified two models that have similar features and the same price, machine A and machine B. You decide to check product reviews to help with your decision. For machine A, you find lots of reviews, some positive and some negative. You judge that the machine is okay, but not outstanding in any way. For machine B, despite searching for a long time, you can't find even a single review. Assuming you don't have any other choices and need to make a purchase, would you buy machine A or B? In this scenario, you can expect an ambiguity-averse individual to choose machine A as this machine is okay and would do the job. Of course, machine B could turn out to be superior to machine A, 
but because of the ambiguity, the individual leans towards machine A. Our final example about the implications of ambiguity aversion will be about shortened URLs. Many of us have come across these in social media, emails, etc. Here you can see both the full and the shortened URL for our tutorial on calculating the correlation coefficient between the returns of two stocks. Both links would take you to the same page, but which one would you prefer to click? The first link shows both the domain name and the title of the page, whereas the second link is completely ambiguous about both. For that reason, most of us would prefer to click on the full URL. As a separate note, always check if the actual link address matches what's shown on the link as scammers often use this tactic to take you to a different page. Ambiguity aversion can be summarized as our tendency to avoid options that have missing information. It's distinct from risk aversion, which is about preferring a safe outcome over an expected one with the same value but with some risk. In contrast, ambiguity aversion involves giving more weight to potential downsides or drawbacks rather than potential upsides or benefits in ambiguous circumstances.